how many people in the UK do you reckon pray? Um, what do you think? Um, how many people pray around us? Um, I obviously did my little Google research this week, as we often do. Um, and when it comes to praying, um, apparently over half of the UK population prays. I don't know whether that surprises you or doesn't surprise you, but over half of the UK population pray. Whatever that means, they pray. Um, so in my head, I'm thinking, well, two questions. Who are these people praying uh, to? And then secondly, what are people praying for? Well, apparently this survey that I looked at went on and told us what people are praying for. 71% of people are praying for family. 42% are actually thanking God, whoever they think that God is. 40% are praying for healing. 40% are praying for their friends. 24% are praying for poverty and disaster. Um, I was praying against disaster yesterday because we'd gone, uh, me and some family and friends had gone to see the seals at Ravenscar, which is near here. Now, if you know that, you've got to go down a big cliff um, to get there. Um, And when you go down down the cliff, you've then got to come up the cliff. But if you saw the weather yesterday, it was really windy, wasn't it? I think we had the back of, was it Storm Dennis? I think, I don't know what was going on. But we had a big storm and it was terrifying. And there was one point where literally all four of us kind of got on the deck on the edge bit of the cliff. And I was praying at that point, Lord, keep us safe, because I had visions of a helicopter coming to rescue us. Um, So we we pray when we we know we need to. Um, But in this section of Matthew 6, um, Jesus is speaking about prayer. And here's, here's two of the big things that I think Jesus wants us to know here. I think Jesus wants us to know who we should be praying to, and I think Jesus wants to know what we should be praying uh, for. Um, so firstly, let's think about who we should be praying to from these firstly. And as Jesus uh, shows us the answer to this question, he, he does it by showing us two mistakes that people of his day were making when it came to prayer. Um, So firstly, we see a father who always sees, a father who always sees us when we pray. Look with me at verse 5 from those verses. Um, Chapter 6, verse 5 on page 970. Jesus says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. So Jesus introduces us to these people that he calls the hypocrites. Now, I know for a fact, because I've been talking about it this morning, that in our congregation, we've got a few uh, drama queens with us, people into drama. Now, I wonder um, if you're one of those drama queens this morning, let me tell you, you are a hypocrite. Did you know that? very nice, isn't it, to come to church and to be called a hypocrite? Well, you are a hypocrite. And let me tell you why. Because that word hypocrite basically means stage actor. That's where it comes from. I think it's a Greek word if you're into uh, things like that. Um, I think it's a Greek word. But it basically means the root of it is stage actor. So someone who puts on a face when they're on the stage. Someone who puts on a face to show an identity that isn't truly them. There's something that they're not showing us. They show us one thing, but actually... In reality, they're someone else, aren't they? They're not really the person they are on stage. So it's good. If you, if you go to the YMCA, if you're on stage there, or at a Stephen Joseph Theatre, and you're on stage, then it's good. Be a hypocrite. It's right for you to be a hypocrite. But here's the problem that Jesus says. There's a problem when we behave like the hypocrite in our spiritual prayer life. Apply it to our prayer life, says Jesus, and we've got a problem. Now, if I went... Um, as we see in verse 5, these people praying in the synagogues on the street corners. If I went out into the town centre of Scarborough, started praying out loud on the street corner uh, this afternoon, people uh, would probably think I was a bit strange, wouldn't they, um, if I did that. But in Jesus' day, what we've got to understand is Jesus talks about these hypocrites who are praying in the synagogues publicly and are praying in the street corners. and No one would think that was strange at all. In fact, it might in Jesus' day. If you were seen to be the person who was praying publicly in the synagogue, if you were the person out in the street praying at the time of day that you were meant to pray, then you might be seen as one of the elite, one of the top dogs. You would be uh, really high up in that spiritual food chain. So if you're praying in public, well done. That's what people would be saying to you. But notice what Jesus called these people. So that they would be popular, but notice what Jesus calls them. Jesus calls them hypocrites because Jesus sees through these people with razor-sharp vision. Listen again to verse 5. 
Jesus says they love to pray. Why? Because they love God so much? No, they love to pray, says Jesus, to be seen by others. These people have taken the amazing gift of prayer where small, fragile human beings, human creatures like us can communicate with the creator of the universe. That's what prayer is, where small, insignificant creatures like us can communicate with the God who made everything, the stars and the planets, just let that sink in for one moment. That's what prayer is. I am talking to the one who made everything, really, not, not thinking I am, not pretending I actually am. Isn't that amazing? And <laughs> Thank you, yeah, it is. It is. It is amazing. Um, they've taken that wonderful gift, they've rejected that privilege in order to use it as a stage prop for themselves to get the spotlight shone on them. That's what they've done. How shocking is that? So what does Jesus have to say? Well, Jesus says, don't be like them. Don't be like the hypocrites, verse 5. He says, don't be like them, but then verse 6, what does he do? He gives us an alternative way of praying. So look with me at verse 6 and see what Jesus says. He says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now there's a question, isn't it? Here's a question coming up, sorry. Does this mean that we've got prayer wrong? Jesus says, pray, go in your room, close the door. That's where you should pray. Have we got prayer wrong? Because we pray in church, we pray in life groups, don't we? So have we got prayer wrong? Um, are Are we not actually allowed to pray in public, in church or life group? I don't think Jesus here at all. This doesn't fit with the way Jesus speaks in the Sermon on the Mount. It doesn't fit with the rest of the New Testament either. Jesus is not giving us a strict rule about where and when we must pray. Jesus isn't in the business of limiting our prayer life. We see that nowhere across the New Testament. We see public prayers and prayers of all kinds in the New Testament. So Jesus isn't limiting our prayer life. So what is Jesus' point here in verse 6? Well, Jesus' words in verse 6 are a great test, aren't they, of where our hearts are and where these hypocrites' hearts were when they prayed. You see, the hypocrites, they can't pray in the quiet of their own room, can they? Because prayer to them has become a performance. And what does a performance need? A performance needs a human audience, doesn't it? A a human audience to get the applause that they're really craving. So they can't pray in their room because they need an audience to do their prayer thing or what they think is prayer. And Jesus says they've received their reward because they've had their applause from people. Yet the disciples, says Jesus, can go into the quiet of their room and pray and because they have appreciated the true joy of prayer. The joy of prayer that is a relationship where you can speak to your Father in heaven, your powerful, mighty, creator, Father, who is tender and loves and listens. And you can go and speak with your Father, and He will see you in that moment as you're speaking to Him. He's going to see you in the secret, and He will reward you with treasure in heaven. That's amazing. That is the wonder of prayer. And so you can go into your room because you've grasped what prayer is. It is you talking to your Father, the mighty Father, who is listening to His children. And you can go, and He's going to see you every time. And so prayer, we've got to know, has only one audience, an audience of one, sorry. It's got one audience, sorry, and it's an audience of one. Um, it's not the crowd in the street. It's not, it's not us in church. It's not our life group. It's not wherever we're praying, but the audience is only ever our Father in heaven. A Christian then, what is a Christian? Someone who has faith in Jesus and therefore has come to be adopted into the Father's family, the family of the unseen Heavenly Father. We come as sons and daughters because we come to Jesus. We've got connected with the Father. And now we can enjoy this intimate relationship. And part of that intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father is the joy of prayer, of talking to Him, of sharing our concerns with Him. What a privilege. And so knowing that, knowing that we come only to the Father, that's our, <laughs> our only audience. It means a few things for us. And firstly, I think this morning it means that Your father always sees your efforts of prayer. 
Prayer is never wasted. You know, prayer can feel like hard work sometimes, can't it? But your father always sees when you pray. Your prayers are never, ever wasted. He always sees and he always hears. But secondly, uh, for some of us perhaps, this might be the case that just like the religious hypocrites of Jesus do, we need to be careful, don't we, to not let prayer become a means for us to show off. Um, we, can, we can all be tempted uh, to do that in different ways, but we can use prayer uh, if we're not careful. And this can crush others around us, can't it? Um, but lastly, and perhaps most importantly, there might be a temptation for some of us as part of Trinity Church to not want to pray uh, with other Christians. There might be a temptation among us this morning to not want to pray out loud with other Christians. I don't know what to say. I might pray the wrong thing. I might say the wrong thing. I don't know what to pray for. Well, here's the thing. I think Jesus' words can help us to be liberated this morning from these feelings. When we realize that our prayers don't need to be a performance. When we pray... Um, And as we pray in life groups, when we're together, all we're doing is speaking to our Father. That's the only audience that matters as we pray. Now, I know know there's people that feel that, feel that that tension as we're praying in groups. Oh, I don't want to speak because I don't know what they're going to say and I don't know what they're going to think about what I'm saying. But be liberated and be free because all that matters is your Father hearing your prayers. And let me tell you, your Father is a perfect, loving Father and He looks at His children, the stammering children that can't get their words out. And He delights in it and He loves it and He wants to hear it. That's the kind of father we have. And so sure, as you go on in your Christian life, your prayers might become more fluent publicly. But, but here's a father who wants to hear. And if he wants to hear, then let's be people who pray. It's hard, isn't it? We feel that tension. And, but let's be encouraged to pray. So there we go. A father who sees as we pray. But secondly, slightly more briefly, as we think about who, who we're praying to, the father who knows what we need in verses 7 to 8. Do you know about the, the classic British uh, tourist? Um, do you know how the, the classic British tourist likes to communicate? Um, through two well-tried, I say t- well-tried, they don't really work, uh, two well-tried means. Firstly, they speak louder. And secondly, they repeat things over and over because we're rubbish at languages in this country. Um, everyone who comes here can speak lots of languages, but we can't speak languages. So we speak louder and we repeat things over and over again. Now, Jesus was aware of a similar mistake when it comes to prayer in verse 7. Look, look, with, what, look with me what he says in verse 7. And when you, pray, when you pray, he says, don't keep on babbling like pagans. <coughs> but they think they will be heard because of their many words. So this was the practice then, this, this babbling that Jesus is talking about. This, this was the practice of the pagan non-Jewish world around the time of Jesus of people when they prayed. People thought in that world, people who worshipped all kinds of other uh, gods, they thought that if they would repeat uh, the right things over and over again, that if they spoke loudly enough, if they said the magic words, if they said the right things, then here's what would happen. They would unlock the generosity of their God and their God would be forced to answer them. And this is how prayer often works in religion, isn't it? Say the right words in the right way, um, we might make our equivalents today. Um, maybe God won't answer my prayer unless I finish with in Jesus' name. Or maybe God won't answer my prayer unless I say please and thank you enough times. But here's the thing about our Father in heaven. He's not a Father. He's not a God who needs his arm twisting around his back. That's not the, that's not the picture of God the Father in the Bible. He doesn't need his arm twisting around our back. Verse 8, read with me. Listen to what he says. Uh, Do not be like them, says Jesus, for your Father (laughs) knows what you need before you ask him. See, God our Father is not the God in in bed sleeping under his heavenly duvet. He's not there waiting for the repetitive nagging of his children's prayers to wake him up. He is the one, though, the Bible says, who sits enthroned over the whole world. He sees and knows all things. And so he sees and knows what's going on in our lives. And this should give us confidence, shouldn't it? To ask what we need. We're not, he's not the God who needs his generosity unlocking. It's not the God who's in bed who needs waking up. He's there. He knows. He cares. And he's ready 
to hear our prayers. So here's the question. If God knows what we need already, then why should we pray? I think there's two reasons. And there's two reasons why we can still pray. If God knows, then why bother? There's two reasons, I think. Firstly, because God is glorified. God is made to look great when we depend on him. When we come to him exercising faith that he can do it, that he can help. So when I go up to Dan, a man in church who knows about cars, and say, Dan, my car's broken. What do I do? I need help. I honour Dan, don't I, by my request for help. I don't dishonour him. I elevate him. I make him to look great, don't I? And it's the same with God. When we come to God with our requests, we don't dishonour him when we bring our requests. We honour him. We say, God, you are great. So why pray? Because God gets the glory and he deserves it. But secondly... Because I think God wants us to enjoy the delight that prayer is. We can all be honest here, can't we? My heart doesn't always beat faster at the thought of spending time praying. It's not the natural reaction all the time. Yes, get to pray. It's not not sadly the way I always feel. Yet when I do, when I do pray, there is nothing better than coming to God in prayer and enjoying relating to him in that way sharing my concerns, giving him praise, saying, God, I need your help, being liberated from the stress and strain of taking it all on my shoulders. There's a joy in coming to our Father in prayer. So we pray, and God sees as we pray, and God knows what we need. But lastly, and our second big question that we thought about at the beginning, there is the Father that we pray to. But Jesus also wants to tell us, How is it we should pray? What kind of things should we pray for more briefly? Well, in this uh, next section, kind of starting at verse 9, we see what are some of the most famous verses in the Bible. Um, And these verses could maybe better be called, they're often famously known as the Lord's Prayer. They could actually be called the Disciples' Prayer, couldn't they? Because they're written as a model for disciples. That is, people that follow Jesus. Um, So verse 9. Um, Jesus says this, this is then how you should pray. This is a model. It's a prayer you can pray, yeah, but it's also a model for us as we pray. So this is going to be a very brief crash course in the model prayer for disciples of Jesus. You can pray this prayer as it is, but, but as I say, you can learn the kind of things that Jesus says here are the kind of things um, that are good to pray for. And there's two big There's two big ways of of splitting this up. Firstly, uh, the prayer begins with prayers for God's glory. And so let's see that first um, in verse 9. Firstly, we see that we we pray uh, for God to be first. Verse 9, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Do you notice how this prayer then, this model prayer, doesn't start where often I'm tempted to make my prayers start. Often I just start my prayers by saying, God, I need this, I need that. And I put my shopping list in front of God's eyes and say, there's my shopping list of needs. Here you go, God, can you deal with it? That, that's not, it's not wrong to bring our shopping list, but that's not where this prayer starts. Dear God, I'd like a new house. I'd like to pass my exams. Instead, hallowed be your name. But what on earth does that mean? Well, I think simply it means this. It means that we're not like the hypocrites who shine the spotlight on themselves. But as we pray, we come to God and we ask that God would shine the spotlight on himself and say, God, um, you are first, you are great. Hallowed means set apart. It means different. It means holy. It means different. And this prayer is about asking God to show how different, how glorious he is in comparison to all others. So God, as I come to you, show yourself to be great, completely pure, completely perfect, completely powerful. Now, this is such a healthy thing for us to do, not only because it puts God first, not only because it's a prayer for God's glory, but because it corrects our our tendency, doesn't it, in our hearts to go to the selfish bit, the bit about me, doesn't it? It corrects that. It reminds me that my true, deepest source of joy and satisfaction is not in me and and my problems being solved, but in in me being connected to God. That's the greatest issue of my heart, isn't it? It reminds me of that. God is the greatest. And so with our eyes focused on him, what does Jesus tell us to pray next? Well, we're next to pray for God's rule. Your kingdom come, says Jesus in verse 10. 
Now, this is not a prayer for God to send his tanks and soldiers to take over when he says, your kingdom come. God's kingdom refers to anywhere and anyone whom Jesus rules over. So in one sense, that is everywhere all the time, isn't it? Your kingdom, God's kingdom. In one sense, God rules everywhere, doesn't he? But specifically, as we talk about the kingdom, we're talking about those who have submitted to Jesus as king of their lives. So when we pray for God's kingdom, we're praying for two things. In one sense, we're praying for the day to come when every knee will bow before Jesus. We're saying, bring that day closer. The day when we all bow before Jesus, when Jesus' enemies are destroyed, but when he gathers his people together in the place of peace forever. We want that day come. We want wars to end. We want the problems to stop. But this, uh, this prayer um, most certainly includes praying for more people to come under the rule of God now. While we wait for that day, we want more people to come under the rule of God now. Your kingdom come. Put more people in your kingdom, God. For more people to realize that they're sinners in need of a savior like Jesus. For more people to trust in him. For more people to obey him. For more people to have their lives completely changed by him. And how endless is that prayer when you think about it? You know, sometimes we scratch our heads, don't we? And we think, what shall I pray for? Well, when you get this right, your kingdom come. How many people in the world can I pray for to come under the rule of Jesus? It's endless, isn't it? I can't stop. I can, I can think of so many people. I might need to write them down. That might help me not forget because my brain, our well, brains are small, aren't they often? Um, but, but we write them down and we can pray for more people to come into God's kingdom. So thirdly then, we pray for God's name to be first. We pray for God's rule. We pray for God's ways to win. Your will be done. Again, in verse 10. Praying for God's ways to win is not like watching a Champions League final or any kind of sporting match and and hoping that God's ways uh, will win, that the right team wins. Ultimately, we know that God's ways, God's will, will be done, won't it? Ultimately, we know God's will will be done. His plans are perfect. And ultimately, one day, he will bring everything under himself. Yet while we wait for the final whistle, we can pray that God's right, just, and good ways would win where currently we see them defied by humans. So where there is abuse and war and violence, we can pray for peace and reconciliation and healing. We can pray for God's ways to win in moral issues in our country when it comes to marriage, when it comes to abortion, when it comes to these big things. God, your will be done. Let your ways rule in our lives, in our spiritual lives. God, I need your help. Your will be done in my life. I'm so tempted to wonder, but by your spirit, help me. Help me to follow your ways. Your will be done. So having prayed then these big prayers for God's glory, for God to be first in the world, we can also turn, finally, to pray for God's provision in the physical and spiritual needs. So the last bit of our guide this morning is for our physical needs, for, God's provi- for, for our needs, sorry, for God's provision in verse 11 to 15. And there Jesus says, we're to pray for our physical needs. Give us today our daily bread, verse 11, says Jesus. It's easy in the busyness of life and also in what can be, for many of us, the comfort of living in a country like the UK to not want to pray into the detail of our life. Things are easy to grab hold of for us in the West or that easy air. But Jesus' exact word in here is to pray for daily bread. What does that mean? Does that mean we just pray literally for the loaf of bread to be on the table? Well, I think we can pray for the loaf of bread to be on the table. I think Jesus wants us to pray and thank him and ask him to provide our daily food. But I think it's much more than that, that God wants us to pray. Jesus wants us to pray for our daily provision. Our Father is in the business of providing our needs, whether it's food or whether it's other practical things. We're not to think that God is too busy today to bother with the detail of our lives. What have we heard about this Father who sees us as we pray, who knows what we need? And so we can ask him, can't we? He's not too busy. He cares. He's a loving Father and we can pray into the detail. When we lose our keys, it gives God glory to say, God, help me find them. That detail even, I think, is what uh, our Father would have us pray. Uh, Secondly, we pray for our spiritual renewal. And forgive us our debts, says Jesus, as we have forgiven our debtors, verse 12. The idea 
of a debt then here is a spiritual debt. We're talking about sin. That's what we're talking about. And as Christians, we can have the joyful confidence that we have been made right with God through Jesus because of his death on the cross. If you're a Christian, if you follow Jesus, then your relationship with God is right. It's justified. It's perfect. It's sorted. That is the truth. It's done and dealt with. All of our sin, all of our guilt is, guilt is away because of Jesus' death on the cross. He did it. Yet in our daily walk, we don't live uh, perfectly, do we? We know that. And so our sins then, as followers of Jesus, don't see us kicked out of the house. They don't see us kicked out of the Father's family anymore. But they do mean that we need to regularly ask God to forgive our debts, our sins, both reminding ourselves of the gospel and making sure that as we ask for that forgiveness, we've turned back to our Father, that we ourselves are walking in close communion, in close relationship with our Father. It is a healthy thing to do. It's the reason we do it um, every day at church. We're not kicked out of the house, but we need to come back under the loving submission of our Father. So we say, forgive us our debts as we do that. And how do we know we've truly grasped this forgiveness? Because we'll be those who share it with others. I want to say this, and we are drawing to an end, but do you know that there is a power, and maybe you don't know this, maybe today you need to know this, but there is a real power over your anger, over your bitterness, and over your pain. It is a power called the gospel of forgiveness. And that gospel that Jesus gives us, the fact that Jesus died on the cross, first means forgiveness for us. And let me tell you that when you've tasted that forgiveness, there is a real power in our lives that means that we can be those who forgive others. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who've sinned against us. There is a real power in the gospel that once we've tasted, yes, thank you, Father, Jesus paid the price for my sin. I'm in reconciled relationship with you. There is a real power to be able to forgive others. And if you know that, then you've known forgiveness for yourselves. Maybe we could talk more about that um, later. But finally, the last in this model of prayer is to pray against the influence of evil. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, verse 13. We're encouraged to actively pray against evil and the evil one. TV and movies done a good job of tricking us into believing the devil only works in haunted houses and with eerie music playing in the background. However, the reality is the devil is active in seeking to tempt us through the subtle things and through the good things in life. And he wants nothing more than the Christian to be knocked away from that wonderful relationship with their father. The Christian life is a battle. Following Jesus is a daily fight. And yet we have prayer as a tool to call on in this fight to pray against those specific temptations in our lives. And so finally, as we finish, why does Jesus leave us with these last words. I don't know if you noticed, we read right the way uh, to verse 15, didn't we? And Jesus finishes after his model prayer with these words. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Why does Jesus finish with these words? I think one reason is this. It is one of the true great litmus tests, isn't it, of whether we've understood what it means to be a forgiven sinner in a relationship with our Father, if we can forgive others. I think that's why Jesus mentions this. It is one of the true litmus tests. The freedom to forgive others is the sign that you yourself have known that you have been forgiven. That's where it starts, knowing that you've been forgiven. When you know that, you can forgive others. That is the great sign um, And it is the great sign that ultimately you've come to know that Father, the Father God in heaven, who is the one who is seeing us as we pray, who knows what we need, who longs for his children to come and pray. So when you've got that gospel, when you know Jesus, when you know forgiveness, here is a Father who you can pray to and who will hear your prayers.